Good morning. Welcome to our service this morning. We're going to be uh, singing hymn number 87, Joy to the World. Let's open with a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for this time of year. This time of year, Lord, we remember all that you have done for us. Coming to earth in the form of a baby, Lord. Giving up so much for us. Lord, thank you for loving us. For showing so much love to the unlovely. Lord, thank you for the opportunity that we have today to worship you in song and listening to what you have to teach us through your messenger, Lord. May we truly go grow closer to you in our relationship with you, Lord. And may we love you more today than we ever have before. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you all so much for being here this morning here in the building. There are some faces here. It's nice to see some, uh, some of the seats being filled by some of you who have... Uh, wanted to, or I showed an interest of being here in the building. Um, for those of you who are attending online, thank you so much for tuning in. If this is your first time here attending a Faith Baptist Church uh, service, we just want to welcome you and uh, tell you that we are so glad that you have tuned in and chosen to worship the Lord today with us in our church service. As far as announcements go, I do have a couple really cool announcements coming up. I didn't have really have anything, and the pastor's like, I got something really cool that I have planned going on. <clears throat> so, for those of you who, who do not have a YouTube account, this week, I need you to go online and set up a YouTube account. I need you to be able to tune in to the chat group because we're going to need some of your feedback for something going on. We have a serve for our Christmas service on the 27th of December. We're going to need your input. We're going to need you to be able to talk back with us through the chat um, bar on the side of the YouTube channel so that you were able to get some input from you. So, <clears throat> Pastor is planning something really special, and you're going to want to be able to do that. So, if you do not know how to set up YouTube channel, there's a phone number in the description. Go ahead and call that number, and we're going to make sure that you're able to get set up with the YouTube channel so that you're able to communicate with us and be part of our Christmas service coming up on the 27th of December. So there's going to be something really cool going on, and you are not going to want to miss it. Also, uh, there is a really cool um, service coming up on Christmas Day. Pastor is going to be broadcasting a special little clip for all of you who are interested in tuning in and being part of it at 10 o'clock on that morning, on Christmas morning. 
And it's an opportunity for all of you as a family to join us together and be part of our Christmas Day service at 10 o'clock a.m. in the morning. So you do not want to miss that. Make sure you are tuned into that. We'll probably send out a reminder so that you're all able to be aware about what's going on. But uh, make a note, whatever you need to do, schedule it at 10 o'clock in the morning on Christmas Day. We have a special service planned. Um, that does it for my announcements. Um, thank you all so much for being here once again. Brother Paul's going to come with our next song. We're going to be singing number 93, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, number 93. <clears throat> Hark the Herald Angels Sing, glory to the newborn King, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reckon. Who is he on yonder tree? 
dies in grief and agony. Tis the Lord, a wondrous story. Tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall. Crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Who is he that from the grave comes to heal and help and save? Who is he that from his throne rolls through all? Tis the Lord, a wondrous story. Tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall. Crown him, crown him, Lord of all. At his feet we humbly fall. Crown him, crown him. We're going to be singing number 100, number 100, O Come All Ye Faithful. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up or swipe, I guess, to John chapter number six. John chapter six. How many of you sitting at home just said, oh boy, all right? I wanted to just kind of further comment on what Pastor Matt had said about signing up for a YouTube account. Uh, we want to have a service where we can have interaction. And the easiest way to do that is for you to be able to access the chat, the section below the video that's going right now, and that only exists during the live broadcast. 
and you can't comment in there unless you have an account. We would do a video to show you how to do it, but it changes so much from device to device that you might be signing up on your phone or your tablet or your computer. And so try and do it on your own. If you're not able to sign up for a YouTube account on your own, then just call us at the church line. As Pastor Matt said, we've given you the phone number in the description below. Uh, we'll make sure that that's down there. And you can give us a call and either Pastor Matt or myself will actually talk to you, walk you through it. I've got some uh, deacons that are way better at this stuff than me, may even put you in touch with them. And maybe you're panicked and you're saying, but I still won't be able to do the chat. We will also have a number that you can text in. But if everybody texts that number, we would start to have some problems. So either way, we're going to have a really special service on the 27th, and I want you to have access to it. And then as Pastor Matt mentioned, Christmas morning, we'll be doing a broadcast, a reading of the Christmas story together at 10 o'clock in the morning. That will actually be live. It'll be there so you can look at it afterward if you miss it. But if you tune in at 10 o'clock, we'll do a live reading of the Christmas story and get to do Christmas together in a really special way. John chapter 6, before I introduce you to the message this morning, hopefully you've already seen the title that you didn't see that coming. Hopefully you didn't see that coming, all right? But before I get into the message, let me just ask you, are you a big present person or a little present person? I was going to do this, but I told my wife, I said, you know, I want Christ to be the center of worship, so I'm not going to load up the platform with distractions, but I wanted to get like a refrigerator box and wrap it and put it on this side, like just a big, huge, massive, giant box. So imagine on this side of the platform, I've got this huge box that's slightly taller than me. Nice, big, huge, big bow on it, whatever color wrapping you want. By the way, what color is your wrapping paper? I don't know why, mine's red. All right, so you've got it in your mind. Maybe you put white wrapping paper on it. Is the bow on the top or the front? Big box. Over here is a box that'll fit in the palm of my hand. Here's the question. Which one, if you had to choose only one, which one would you choose? And everybody's different. Some people are thinking, you know, I think about that big box and there's just no way that there'd be junk in that big of a box. The bigger the box, the better. And the ladies are hoping that there's jewelry in this box sitting in my hand right here. And so you're a little box person. I'll tell you, I'm the big box kind of guy. I want the biggest thing possible. Because even if it's not good, it's still huge. Maybe you're a tiny box kind of person. Which one are you? And the whole point is, we are very good at missing it. This morning, I hope that you don't miss the largest facts about the Christmas story. I want to show them to you, but before I do, hear this theme that we're going to develop from the heart of Jesus himself. In John chapter 6, and I have to admit, we're diving into the middle of a reading here, but uh, for sake of time, I think you'll catch enough if we start in verse 60. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And if you're wondering what he said, you can go back and read all of chapter 6 because he said, I'm the bread of life. Uh, the, the, the Jews asked Jesus, give us a sign. Moses gave us bread. What are you going to give us? And he said, I'm, I'll give you bread. And they said, well, where's the bread? And he said, I'm the bread. If you don't eat of me and drink my blood, you will not live. And they got really upset at that thought because they thought he was talking about cannibalism. They didn't know that he was talking about dying on the cross and becoming sustaining life for us through his sacrifice. And so he describes this for them but leaves it veiled because he hasn't died yet. And when people heard it, they were really upset by it. So we pick up our reading. Many of the disciples, when they heard this saying, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Isn't it overwhelming to think that one of the earliest times Jesus gave the picture of the gospel, people immediately were rejecting it? And yet he says, you think this is offensive? The thought of eating me as bread and drinking me? Wait till you see what they really do to God. 
But then he indicates, you think I'm talking about flesh, but I'm talking about spiritual things. He said in verse 64, there are some of you that believe not. If you're a part of this worship service right now, and your automatic assumption is that you're right where you ought to be, think again. Because everyone always does. Many thought they were square on when it came to Jesus. Have you ever asked that question? Which one of the disciples would you be? Everyone wants to be John, the one that Jesus loved. But I wonder how many of you would say, oh, Peter. I wonder how many of you would admit you'd be a Judas. The truth is probably none of us would have been one of the 12. Maybe, maybe we would have been one in this group. But we always put ourselves as John, don't we? The one whom Jesus loved. Well, don't miss it. You think you're so good at picking. Have you ever had, had anybody tell you, I'm really good at reading people? Have you, ever, have you ever heard anybody say that? The only people that I have known in my life that are really good at it never realize that they are. They just do it. And anyone that thinks that they are, they might be, they might not be. But everyone, I don't know anyone that says, oh man, I'm a terrible read of all people. Why? Because we want to believe we're good at things. And there's no possible way we've missed it when it comes to God. There's no possible way we've missed it when it comes to Jesus. But he says, there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. For that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So you thought he was talking about Judas. At one point, Jesus had dozens of followers. And it's in this moment that they turn and walk away from him. Verse 67, this gets my heart. I hope it gets yours too. And said, Jesus unto the twelve, will you also go away? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom... Shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve? One of you is a devil. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Chapter 7, keep reading, verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, that he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand, and his brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence. We're talking blood brothers here, okay? We're not talking like... The brothers that we have in the church family, we're talking about the blood relation, the family of Jesus. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that, the, uh, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly if thou do these things, Show thyself to the world. Do you know what they're saying in verse 4? You're hanging out where there's hardly anybody doing these incredible things. But no one does that if they want to truly be popular. So if you're here to be popular, why aren't you in Judea? Why are you hanging out here in Galilee where there's nothing going on? If you want to be famous, you got to expose yourself to people. But you're over here doing this stuff where no one gets to see it? And if you continue to read in verse 5, this crushing blow if you're a friend of Jesus, for neither did his brethren believe in him. And so if you go back and you look at chapter 6, let's, let's get the image. Let's put it all together. Jesus just tells them, I'm going to die for you. And they don't say thank you. They say, oh, that's disgusting. And they question him, and it's written all over their faces. He can see it in their heart. And they turn and they leave. And he has his core that are left behind. 
he turns to them and what does he say? Do you see the heartbreak in Jesus here? He turns and he asks, are you going to leave me too? And don't you love Peter comes piercing through the darkness. Where would we go? Who are we going to find that's like you? You have the words of life. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, there's another time when Peter says that in Matthew chapter 16. And Jesus stops everything and says, did you hear what he said? But if you read it, Jesus didn't do that at this point. He doesn't stop and say, oh, well, that was, thank you. That edified me. It totally turned me right around. No. What does he do? He goes from Peter who says, hey, you're it. Then he says, oh, really? Am I? Because one of you, and goes right back to the negative. One of you doesn't believe that I am. If you think that you can live your life missing Christ without breaking his heart, it's one of Satan's biggest lies. The gospel is personal, and so is your life. And it's not personal with me and pastor, although I remember the first time someone fell asleep while I was preaching. It took about six months. And when someone finally fell asleep in that school gymnasium, it was like a knife that went into my heart. Because it had never happened to me before, ever. And now I look back and I say, silly young preacher, there's much harder things than someone falling asleep. You think, oh, no, I hope that wasn't me. Am I the one that fell asleep in the school gymnasium? Oh, I wasn't there. It couldn't have been me. No, it was Pastor Matt. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just messing with you. It wasn't Pastor Matt. So you're afraid that it's personal with me, but what you're going to find out when you get there is it's always been personal with Jesus. And we never consider, are we breaking his heart? Turn your back on God's work, and it's guaranteed that you will. Don't miss it. Because the truth is, most miss it. If we back up and start thinking about Christmas, what is Christmas to us? Well, come through my subdivision. Our, our family, we have this big tradition where uh, shortly before Christmas, We'll get into the car with the kids. We'll get popcorn, hot chocolate, something like that. We'll load it up into the car, and we'll go look at the Christmas lights. Now, we're looking for two things. We're looking for the best house, which we usually know which one that is, and we always go there. The guy has one of these looping drive-throughs for a driveway, and so we'll go do this, and it's free to the community, and it's pretty good. It's pretty incredible. I wouldn't want his bill at the end of December, for sure. But the other thing we look for is the worst decorated house. It's like they should not have even tried at all. And so maybe for you, it's the Christmas lights. You say, Christmas doesn't happen for me until I get my tree out. The tree comes up and Christmas season starts. Or maybe it's a little village. Once I get my village up, then Christmas starts. It's a collection of things. Maybe for you, Christmas doesn't really happen until the eggnog. Maybe Christmas happens for you once the presents get torn open. It's probably the saddest is if Christmas is only presents, it only lasts for as long as the paper's on it. Now you tear that off and then the party's over. Have you ever felt that sinking, let down afterward? Like, oh. well, Christmas was presents for you. Whatever it is, that's the majority of the world. That's what Christmas is. But if we come back and we look at the Christmas story itself, there are very few people that celebrated it. There were two that were subjected to it and only one that actually lived it. His name is Jesus. If we imagine ourselves in this story, we'd love to be a shepherd, an angel, somebody that showed up to say thank you for what you did, and yet hardly anyone did. And I'm going to tell you why. Because there are four characteristics in the Christmas story to identifying God's work in our life, and we're not good at identifying those characteristics. And so we think that God isn't doing anything when sometimes he's doing his greatest. And sometimes we think God is doing his greatest when it isn't God at all. 
Here's a fascinating question. Maybe you've heard me say this in years gone by, but I believe that Faith Baptist Church is at the center of God's universe. You say that's slightly egotistical. You could look at it that way, but for me, it's that personal. That I really do believe. My, my boy Lucas asked, he said, who's God's favorite person? And I said, you are. And he said, so I'm more favorite than you? And I said, I didn't say that. I'm his favorite. But I thought you said I'm his favorite. Yep, that's the way God does it. He's absolute in his love. But I, I, I fully believe that everything that is happening at Faith Baptist Church is truly at the center of God's universe. Four characteristics to help us understand. We're only going to do two today because I knew it was going to take this much just to introduce it. So we'll break it into two parts. We're going to look at four characteristics over the Christmas story itself to this week, to next week, to help you identify when God is actually working in your life. Characteristic number one. Let's go ahead and uh, turn to Luke chapter 2. We're going to be here in Luke 2. We're going to go over to Matthew 2 just a little bit. I'm going to spend a lot of time in other passages as well. Verse 1, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. There are a lot of moving parts going on, but this taxed law goes into place, which, by the way, would have been intensely offensive. It would have been like stripping the church of its freedom to worship. And here comes this imposing tax that this, this is awful. But can I tell you something? This is free. This is on the outside. This is not one of the characteristics. God is a master at taking bad things and doing awesome things with them. I would say he's the only one that can do it. And so there's this horrible situation. You have this tax edict that's coming in. And we pick up in verse 3. All went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. Now Joseph also went from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth in Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David. If you're ever wondering, why on earth was Bethlehem so full? It's all David's fault. We think Mary and Joseph were the only ones that couldn't find lodging. That's silly. They were just one of random people from everyone else's perspective. Think about it. This is the house of David. Everybody, everybody has someone famous in their ancestry, right? You go digging into your ancestry and, you know, ancestry.com to find out who who are you connected with. Everybody wants to say that they're connected with David. And so if you are, I'm going back to where David was born. That's my house. I'm of the house of David. And so Joseph, Mary, and a whole bunch of other people, they're all headed to Bethlehem. For what purpose? To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. There were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now remember what I just said. Can Mary and Joseph get lodging? No. Why? There's too many people. But God goes out to the field with the angels to get the shepherds to come and worship. Why? Characteristic number one of God's work. You didn't see it coming. Characteristic number one, when God moves, most people miss it. And there's really specific reason for that. We read the story and it's miraculous to us, but when the story was going on, it was the exact opposite. 
let's get the setting. Because if God gets to do the work, number one, God does it in his time. You remember what God said? A thousand years in our time is like a day in God's time. And a day in God's time is like a thousand years in ours. If you want to do it God's way, it's going to be on his timetable. Which is probably the first reason most people don't ever see God work. Because you just can't wait for him. we got to fix this now. If it's a thousand years and you live only 80, how much of your time will you spend waiting for God to work? Would it shock you if I told you most of your life? I'm not sure that I want to wait 75 years to see God work. Right, and that's why so few miss it. I mean, get the context. In 586, the rest of Israel is brought into captivity, which seems to be an absolute violation of the promises God had made. Because God had promised that a king would come that would rule the world and he would come out of Israel. Well, how can that happen if all of Israel is taken captive in 586? When Jesus comes into the world, Israel has not reestablished itself. So for 500 years, they've been in the opposite direction. If you read Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says, and by the way, the wise men know where to go looking. We'll look at that in just a minute. They know where to go looking. How did they know where to go looking? How did Herod, who had all the infants killed, know where to go looking? How did they know where it would be? Because the Bible says in Micah 5, chapter 2, that the Messiah would come out of Bethlehem. And that if the Messiah is in the world, he had to have come out of Bethlehem. Scripture says that Jesus was one born out of due time. As God's timing. Most miss it. 586 years in captivity. And then Jesus shows up. Not before they go into captivity. Not five years after. 586 years After they're taken away, Jesus shows up to rescue everyone. 586 years of silence. Micah 5.2 was written almost 800 years before Jesus was born. Backtrack to the promise that God made to David. If you go to 2 Samuel chapter 7, I'll show it to you quickly. I don't have time for all of these texts, but I want to show you David's. It's very special. Second Samuel chapter 7, give you the real quick context. David has been fighting. He finally sits down, and he's in his house of cedar. And could you imagine having a house built of only cedar? Oh, every guy wants that house. Every guy with a beard wants that house, right? Just every breath is in full fresh cedar. Just wow. Cedar's a Lebanon. And he's sitting there, and he realizes, I'm sitting in a house of cedar, but The Ark of the Covenant is sitting in a tent. I'm not okay with that anymore. Oh, that people would have the heart of David. That the ministry of Jesus Christ would not suffer while men go on succeeding. That's the heart of David. He says, man, I'm not comfortable with that. We got to do something about this. And so he wants to, and God says, no. Look at verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. I will establish his kingdom. Now, it's interesting because you would assume that God must be talking about one of David's direct sons, but we know that the exact opposite happens with Solomon. Solomon is the one that splits the kingdom up between his sons because they're fighting. So whoever he's talking about, it's not Solomon. Continue to read. He shall build an house for my name and will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. You go back and read Matthew chapter 1 and you find out that Jesus was born under the house of Joseph. Joseph, a a direct descendant of David. This promise was made a thousand years before Jesus Christ was born. 
Most miss it because no one is willing to wait in God's time. If you go back to the next promise before this, you have to go back to the promise that was made to Moses. And we don't have time, but in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 15, God tells Moses, I'm going to raise up a prophet. And Moses tells the people, I'm going to raise up a prophet. Now, here's something that's really cool. Maybe you didn't realize this. The name Jesus, we give it a unique name. The name Jesus, we don't use it in our American culture as a nation with a Christian history. And the reason we don't do that is because we want to show highest honor. But some of you may be shocked to find out that Jesus' name wasn't actually English. It was Hebrew. I heard someone one time say that they thought the Bible was written in English. English didn't exist when Jesus was alive. The New Testament was written in Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic. So Jesus is born. He's given a Hebrew name because he's a Jew. It was flash. He wasn't American. And the name that he was given is actually a common name. Now, we call him Jesus, but his actual name is Yeshua, which is a shortened version of Yahashua. Does that sound familiar? It's Joshua. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, Moses has promised a prophet that'll come that'll do what he can't do. Now, Joshua comes on, And he does do some things that Moses isn't able to do, but he never fully rescues the people. It doesn't happen until Jesus comes. And isn't it coincidental that God said a prophet's going to come after you that's going to take care of the people, and Jesus takes on the same name as as the one who replaced Moses, Yeshua. Isn't that cool? Yeshua is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Deuteronomy chapter 15. The name Jesus is Jesus because he's pointing all the way back to the promise he made to Moses 1,500 years ago. In fact, if you study the the word of God, you find this theme that God's will happens in his time. And when God moves, most people miss it because no one's willing to wait that long. In Genesis chapter 18, Abraham is promised that through his seed, his children, a nation would be established, and that from that nation, all other nations would be blessed. The promise of the Messiah to come, that was 2,000 years before Jesus was born. God made a promise to Noah that he wasn't done redeeming mankind. And he put him on an ark, the perfect image of Jesus rescuing you and I. And then at the end, put a bow in the sky for all generations to know that God still saves people. And he told them, I make a covenant with you. I will not destroy you. What I just did for you, I will do for you forever. Jesus is the picture of the ark. The ark is the picture of Christ. Come to him and be saved. And that promise was made to Noah almost 2,500 years before the birth of Jesus. You have to go to Genesis chapter 3 to find the first promise. In verse 15, God is talking to the serpent and he says that you're going to bruise the heel of the woman's child, not the man's, the woman's, but he'll crush your head. And there is the promise that one day a child would come from woman that Satan would attempt to attack and would hurt him, but he would ultimately destroy him. The promise of Jesus in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, 4,000 years before Jesus was ever born. When God moves, most people miss it. Number one, because he does it in his time. And number two, the second reason why most people miss it is because he does it in his way. God does it, number one, in his time, and number two, God does it his way. You say, what's his way? Psalm 8, we just looked at it last week. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength and honor. Everyone expects it to be the most talented and the most obvious, and God uses the most neglected. Why? I found a story 
it was way back in the 90s, of a gentleman who was renting an office space in New York City. And a part of his lease agreement was that all maintenance had to be done by this organization which worked directly for the owners of the building. It was kind of like a scam. It's the way New York City real estate works, I guess. I, mean, I don't know anything about it, but I know it's disastrous over there. And so you had to pay the landlord to fix the light bulb that you burned out, and it was extremely expensive. And so he decided to bring his own light bulb in from home to fix it. And this all sounds fine, but it's not the kind of bulb you can stick in here. It was a seven-foot-long fluorescent bulb. The man managed to sneak it into the office, pull the burnt tube down, and put it back up in. And then he realized, I can't throw this seven-foot fluorescent tube away in the garbage. They'll know that I did it. So he decides he's got to wait till everyone's gone and he's going to take it home with him and he'll throw it away in the dumpster at home behind his apartment. And so he waits till the building clears out, it's all dark, and he finally gets ready to go. He's going home at an off time now. He's going home when everybody else is going home. He goes to get on the subway carrying this seven-foot-tall light bulb. It barely fits into the subway train. And when he props it up on the floor, it covers from the floor to the ceiling. It's a really silly thing. And he's standing there holding it, waiting to get home, and he's back into his normal routine. He's relieved that he got out without getting caught. And he's holding the light bulb when another passenger in the shifting car grabs hold of the light bulb, thinking it's one of those poles inside the subway train. And now he's holding it, and they're holding it, and he's thinking, well, now what do I do? They think this is a pole. And another person grabs it, and another person grabs it, and he's getting closer to his stop. And now there's... This pole is surrounded by people, which is nothing more than a glass light bulb that's not mounted to anything. That everybody's hanging on to it. Well, what would you do? Same thing he did. When he got to his stop, he let go and slipped off, and everyone just stood there holding the light bulb, thinking it was the pole of a train. How many people run around holding on to money, thinking that that's a rescue source? You ain't holding nothing but glass that will burn up in eternity. Man, if I just had a better house, if I just had children, if my kids just had grandbabies, if people respected me, if I was given that position, if the church would say thank you, all fluorescent tubes, hang on to the mighty act of God. Because when he's working, most people miss it. In fact, when you're in the center of what God's doing, because most people miss it, hardly anyone will ever praise you for it. Because you just might be the baby that's God's, that God is using to do the greatest work. Oh, sure, right now the whole world recognizes the birth of Jesus, but that's only because it's obvious when it's going on, it's not. And most miss it. And so here you sit thinking, I've got a hold of Jesus, but maybe you don't. Maybe you don't love him and you've been lying to yourself this entire time. Because characteristic number two about God's work. Here's characteristic number one, in case you missed it. When God works, most people miss it. Characteristic number two, when God works, Satan doesn't. That is, miss it. Not, doesn't work. He doesn't miss it. In fact, in my notes, I actually have it written this way, note takers. When God moves, Satan doesn't, and then put in parenthesis, miss it, like we do. You say, oh, why is that? Because he's better than we are. He's got more talent, more insight, more wisdom, more power, more resources. And he has spent thousands of years watching God do what God is going to do. And you and I have only spent a few decades thinking we've conquered what God does. And Satan laughs because he knows it's really, really easy for us to miss it. And if anyone actually catches it, he caught it too. You say, well, well what's, what's the point, Pastor? If you're a football fan, all you have to hear is the name Wrong Way Roy, and you know about this story. In 1929, there was uh, two college football teams were playing each other a long time ago. And one of the guys that was playing normally doesn't ever touch or carry the ball. He usually doesn't get any fame or anything. He's just, he blocks and he tackles. And that's all that he does. And the guy played offense and defense at the same time. Like, same team, he would do both 
in one game. Well, he was in the game, and the other team had the ball. He was supposed to tackle him. But the guy that was carrying the ball accidentally dropped the ball on the ground. When that happens in football, if someone accidentally drops a ball on the ground before they go down on the ground, anyone can pick up that ball and run with it. Well, Roy Regals, in 1929, playing against Georgia Tech, saw the running back drop the football onto the ground. And he thought, here's my chance. I never get to touch the ball. He reached down, he picked up the ball, and as soon as he did, someone hit him and it spun him around. But as soon as he got his orientation, he took off running. And he was amazed because he was one of the slower guys on the field, and yet no one was catching him. And he's running with the ball, and he thinks, I'm going to get a t- I'm going to score. This is going to be my moment of glory. I've been waiting for this my whole life. And he's running and running, and finally someone catches up to him. It's not the other team, it's his own team. Poor Roy has gotten turned around, and he's now ran 69 yards in the wrong direction. His teammate flags him down, stops him, gets him turned around, and the moment he turns around, on the two-yard line, <coughs> excuse me, the other team immediately tackled him. In fact, the other team had been following him the entire time, but they weren't going to tackle him as long as he was headed in the wrong direction. And the moment he turned around, boom, he was taken out. By the way, his team lost that game because of that mistake. That's why he is forever known in all of history as Wrong Way Roy Regals. Had an illustrious career, came back and battled and had more tackles in that game than any other, but he was more known for his folly than he ever was his success. Most people miss it. You may even spend a lot of your time missing it. But know this, if you finally realize you've been running in the wrong direction, thinking all you have to do is make pastor happy or impress church people to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and you think that's all that it takes, and you're silly for believing that, you're running in the wrong direction. Because I am not your judge, nor is an assembly going to tell you whether or not you're right or wrong. God knows if you love him or not. And so maybe in this message you realize, I need to start really loving Christ every day, talking to him, finding out what the Bible says about him. I, I've got to get to know him. I've been going in the, in the wrong direction. Know this, the moment you turn around, there is an onslaught waiting to take you out. You think about the birth of Jesus. I went and listed it, thinking about how when Cherry and I were first married. When Cherry and I were first married, uh, I was working construction. She couldn't get a job. She was applying furiously for one. And I remember saying how guilty and horrible she felt because it took one month for her to find a job at the bank. And in the meantime, I was working construction, but we got stuck on a job, and so I wasn't getting paid. And so, even more embarrassingly, Cherry had savings. I had drained everything because of Bible college. I had a few hundred dollars when we got married, a couple hundred bucks. I didn't even have enough to go to school that semester. And so... Um, and I, you know, I had to get the apartment to deposit all that stuff that ate up all my money. So I hardly had anything. But Cherry had like $1,000 in her savings account. And we lived off of that until I got my first paycheck. I remember she came home from the bank from her job. I had been working only a couple more months in construction into our marriage. I'd been doing it for almost a year. And I was laying on the floor covered in green paint. I had fallen off a 30-foot ladder and hit the ground. And I thought I broke my ankle. I was covered in blood and paint. Brand new bride comes into the living room and I'm laying there on towels that I've laid on the floor just moaning like a baby. And she goes, oh my, what happened? I said, I fell off a ladder. You what? I I fell off a ladder, I'm going to be fine. And then eventually in the conversation it came out that it turns out the ladder was a 30 foot extension ladder and it was on a porch so I was 40 feet in the air when I fell off this thing. I'd skinned up my elbow. So she's like, well let me clean you up. I'm like, don't touch me right now. Everything hurts. So she just let me lay there. And after a while, she's like, can I just get the paint off of you? And I said, yeah. So she's cleaning the paint off me. And I looked at her, and she's crying because she's trying to get the paint off of my hairy arms without skinning the, the, the blood patches that I've got. And I realized this might not be good for her for me to be working there. That's why I quit and worked in a factory because it was too hard on my wife. And so I went from a factory back to Bible college, but we had to pay for rent, so I did both. The only time Cherry and I got to spend together 
was when she would sit behind me on the couch while I sat in the evening at 11 o'clock at night doing my homework for the next couple days. And then she would bring dinner to me at work at 6 o'clock every night at the factory. She would work during the day. She'd come home, and so now you know why we have cats. We didn't have any babies, so Cherry stayed busy that way. And I look back on our start, and I'm so thankful for what we have now, and I'm thankful that we went through it, but I tell Cherry all the time, man, these married kids in Bible college, I feel for them. And I'm glad I don't ever have to do that again. Think about the start that Mary and Joseph had. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 24, an angel comes to Joseph and tells him to marry Mary, to take her as a wife, even though she's been found with child. Now, I had always assumed that she knew, he knew, she went and told him in secret. I don't know why I thought that. Maybe you have a different image. But I always thought, like, Mary knew she was pregnant. She knew beforehand. And then, of course, obviously, physically, she knew she was pregnant. She was aware of the things that were going on with her. And so she knew, I'm pregnant. There's definitely no doubt. The angel wasn't joking around. And maybe she told her family, but at some point I always thought she had to have told Joseph. But do you know what the Bible says in Matthew? In chapter number 1, verses 18 through 24, it says she was found with child. The word found. That's a public word. In other words, she showed and everybody knew it. It wasn't something that could be kept secret. It can't be hidden. When someone gets pregnant, that's what they are. And it didn't take a genius to figure out nine months of pregnancy, Mary and Joseph not married. Whose child is this? But an angel comes to Joseph and says, go ahead and take her. What's happening with her is a miracle. That's their start. And then, while they're engaged, and he has accepted her formally as his wife, they've got to make a 100-mile trip while she's eight months pregnant to go pay taxes. You want to talk about strain on a relationship. I don't know what it's like to be married to a pregnant woman, and the only thing I can say is I'm thankful for that. Because what you go through with pregnancy, <sighs> that's got to be unbelievably hard. And I've told Cherry, I... I totally said, sorry if this sounds horrible, but I'm really thankful for adoption. And Cherry said after she watched the birth process the first time, she said, so am I. This is their start. And then, of course, they get there, and they don't have that chemistry. They haven't been married for a long time. And if you're picturing someone in their 40s or 50s, stop. They were children for most adults. Kids! You know how you, you, uh, you bump into someone from your past that you babysat and changed the diaper and you run into them? You go, oh my goodness, how are you doing? What grade are you in? And they go, uh, I graduated college two years ago. Like little babies. That's what they were. They're not equipped to deal with this stuff. And then they get to Bethlehem and there's no, there's no place to stay. Opposition. Constant Opposition. There's a reason why everybody missed it. It's because they didn't look successful at all. That's God's work. And then you read in Matthew chapter 2, which I wish we had time. I'm moving fast and covering a lot of scripture. Note takers, jot some of these passages down and read them. They're rich. In Matthew chapter 2, Herod finds out that a king could possibly replace him. Because the wise men stop by and say, hey, have you heard about the Messiah's birth? We're looking for him. Oh, yeah, 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 we, we heard about that. Uh, haven't found him, though. Would you mind letting us know when you find him so we can celebrate with you? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Off they go. He goes back to his seers, his wise men, and says, hey, what is this Messiah stuff they're talking about? Oh, it's in Scripture. It's in the Jewish Bible. What is it? I don't know, it says that a Messiah is going to be born, but it's been saying that for like 500 years and it hasn't happened. Where? Where does it say it? No, where is he going to be born? Oh, it says Bethlehem. And so 
Herod tells them, when you found him, come and bring me word. I'll come and join you guys. And you know the story. The wise men get there, and the angel of the Lord says, don't go back. Why? Because his time had not yet come. He wasn't going to die at the hand of Herod. He's going to live 33 years and then die for you and I. He wasn't going to die for Herod. He was going to die for me. And so what does Herod do? He slaughters all children two years and younger in that area, trying to catch Jesus. And what did God say to the serpent? You'll bruise his head. He's going to crush you. Oh, you tried to get him, and you caused a lot of damage. 1 Peter 5.8 says that Satan is a roaring lion, and he walks about seeking whom he may devour. If you're not fighting the evil one every single day, then I would say you are without a doubt, without a doubt, not a part of the work of God. Because when God is working, although everyone else might miss it, Satan doesn't. Now, it's hard for me to do this, but we don't have a complete picture yet. There are still two more characteristics to help you identify when God is working. But can we pause here for the time being and look at our own hearts. Turn inward and ask that question, do I really think that I've nailed it? Do I really think I found it? Do you believe that you're a part of God's work, the brightest, most glorious, most powerful work in the entire world right now? Because the truth is, we expect God to do the greatest on college campuses and churches of a thousand. But that's not where God does his greatest work. God does his greatest work with small groups of people, with 90 people, with 70 people, with 60 people, with 11 people, with one person. But it doesn't happen unless it's personal between you and God. Do you really love him? Is your relationship with God great? It's hypocritical to celebrate Christmas as though we love Jesus if we don't love him all the time. So here's your challenge. Get in the middle of God's work. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Whether you're here in the building or online, can I just ask you to spend some time in prayer today? Right now, during this time, I invite you to pray and talk to God about his work. Some of you have been measuring your lives and you're saying, man, nothing is successful and nothing is turning out and I'm bitter and I'm angry and I'm frustrated and I'm disappointed. This is when God does his greatest work. Submit to him, yield to him. But just know that if you want God's work, it will come with fierce opposition and it has to be done in his way and in his time. Do you really want to be a part of God's good work? If you're listening today and you've never asked Jesus to save you, then why would you think you're going to go to heaven when you die until you do? That's silly. You need to cry out and ask God to save you, and I hope you'll do that right now. And so right here in the building, I'll ask our piano to play for just a short amount of time and give you all a chance to pray, and then I'll dismiss us in prayer for the day. Father, thank you for the worship service today and all of the unseen faces that have made today possible. Thank you for those that were able to be here in the building. They are an encouragement to get to preach to. It's edifying to get to see God working in people's lives. But Lord, I know that you are doing an awesome work uh, through all those that are attending. I just pray that they would be carving out a true, special, sacred, sanctified worship time that people aren't just grabbing the video in passing, but that they truly are stopping and worshiping you in their life. We look forward to when this season is over, and we ask that you'd protect us and keep us faithful until it is. We're thankful for your work, and I pray that we wouldn't miss it. In Jesus' name, amen.